the key amendment proposals on the ballot for 2018 involves creating an elections and ethics board on a bipartisan basis. House Speaker Pro Tempore Sarah Stevens is here. Republican, thank you so much for being on the program. Thank you for allowing me to be here. It is important to get this explanation out there. Well, how easy is it to understand? There's so many amendments on the ballot. Some do seem easy and then some seem really hard. This one may seem hard, but it's really not. It's very logical and very common sense. Ethics and the Board of Elections are things that you really want to make sure are implemented fairly. And the best way to do that is to have a bipartisan board that's not in the control of one of the people that it seeks to oversee. On the North Carolina Elections Board, I, I don't recall people thinking of it as being overly partisan. It might have been one vote to the majority party. Is that, is it, in my history, in my civics lesson correct on yes. that? What's different about this proposal than what used to be in place for the Elections Board? Um, the new proposal is that there would be eight people on the bipartisan board of elections and ethics. And the reason we went with four, so it wouldn't be dominated by either party, and if the four can't reach an agreement, being bipartisan, being fair, being reasonable, it's as though those people in elected positions need to step back in, be they the governor or be they the House and the Senate, to take some action to resolve whatever difficulty it is this group is having. If you have a nine-member board and they're partisan and they're simply selected by one body, then they have some duty to that one person to perhaps treat them in a better way. Um, in addition, initially, right now, the board is selected by the governor. And what if the governor is under investigation? The governor has the absolute power of appointment and the power of removal. So if the governor doesn't like the stances and steps that you're taking, he can reconstitute the board at will. And that's, I think, a pretty dangerous situation. In recent years, as, as North Carolina's political climate has gotten, I would say hotter, for, for lack of a better term. I Certainly. Mean, it's, it's heated in Raleigh. Has that ever happened where a governor has, uh, uh, for lack of a better word, meddled with the elections board in order to have a favorable outcome on the investigation? Because there's been several issues come before the elections board. I, I, I don't know that yeah. I can specifically right. designate one to you, but we also always don't know what's going on. Sometimes it's taking the governor getting out of office before there's actually an investigation. And we can go back to some of the easily things. While he was in as governor, he, there, there seemed to be some preferential treatment. But when he came out, then there was the, here's all the problems. Here's what we need to, to jump in and deal with. Let's, let's look towards the ethics board, which was legislated a few years ago. It came in. Um, how would it work in conjunction, elections and ethics board? How do the ethics work with the elections as one combined unit? as one combined unit, it, it, it's more clear to tell us that to more quickly and cleanly identify ethics violations if you're combined with the Board of Elections. The Board of Elections will frequently tell us, you've raised money, you've, uh, here's how you're supposed to have spent it, have you gotten your reports in correctly and cleanly, um, are there ethical violations that go on there, are you getting something ethically, we're not allowed to accept in-kind contributions from any kind of corporation. Well, what if the corporation came in and did something for you um, and you knew about it? That, that's an elections violation, but it's also an ethical violation. Um, so having the two together gives us that combined opportunity to make sure these things run cleanly, fairly, and smoothly like they're supposed to. On the makeup of the new board, should it be constituted if voters approve the amendment? Do you see certain board members being uh, professionals or experts in ethics, with some being experts in election law, or will it be where they wear both hats simultaneously and those skill sets are just naturally complementary? I think the skill sets should be complementary. I think they should have some expertise in both. We clearly may want one or two appointed that have the special skills one way or the other, but, but the effort is to learn what the rules are as we appoint you and then be able to do both sides of it. We do want common knowledge in both boards completely. From, from your perspective in leadership, how are or how did the elections board and the ethics board work when they were working well? They were working independently, but what was what was missing in those in the old days, if you will, that in 2019 and beyond that this combined board could rectify a situation? 
I'm trying to get into any kind of specific examples and I'm not sure if I can think those, but there are right. times where the ethics board has needed information that it has not gotten from the board of elections right. or the board of elections may need a quicker ruling on something that the board of ethics has to, to handle. So having them together gets us better effort to get the information out to educate people, but also to work together to enforce whatever the rules and laws are for each board. How about the four to four split under this proposed board when it was a five to four has worked in the past and, and, and has brought to light uh, campaign transgressions on legislators parts and others. Uh, what happens in the case of four four? Do you envision a future where it is partisan, where you expect a lot of four four rulings and then what? Well, if you expect 4-4 rulings, then it's time to make sure the rules are clean, clear, and that's something that should happen on the elected official level, be it the governor or be it the House or be it the Senate. If you have a 4-4, you've got a board that should really want to work together to be doing the right thing. If they're not doing the right thing, it's time to figure out what's the, what's the wishy-washy, what's the thing that's stopping them from coming to a conclusion, because that's, that's their purpose is they have a set of rules to follow. So is there some misunderstanding of the rules or some misunderstanding of the laws? Does that need to be clarified? And, and it's not up to them to clarify it. It's not up mm -hmm. to them to take the judicial position. It's up to them to say, here are the rules. Here's how we've implemented them here. Now something more needs to be done. Whereas if you had a partisan swing and you get in a really close situation, it's just going to fall one way to one party as opposed to having this bipartisan board. What do you make of the separations of powers arguments on this? I think this is a board that, and that's part of what's stated in this amendment, it's a board that while it operates under the administrative branch of the government, needs to be independent. It doesn't need to be answerable to the administrative agencies, or the, the, the administration, the governor, because the governor may be the one under investigation. And this is any governor, not any, just, any governor, just a not, sitting not just, governor, whatever it, year exactly, we want to go into the future. Exactly, exactly. The thing is, if it's good, it's good now, it's good now, it's good in the future, it's good going forward. It it's, doesn't matter who's in office. It doesn't matter who's in the House or the Senate. The reality is we want a board that's going to be fair, impartial, nonpartisan, non -partisan. Uh, and that's why we've said let the House appoint two of one party and two of another party. And remember, we left that open because we have a great independent base that's growing. And if there were a lot of independents in the legislature, they may be the ones who pick the member. And it could be that the Republicans or the Democrats fall to less than, uh, less than top two majorities. So we did make that plan for the future, but it's the two members of each of the caucuses that have the highest number of members. So, so we've made plans in essence there for the future, but also trying to make sure that these people operate independently. While they got an appointment or while they got an appointment from the governor and a nod from the House or the Senate, they know they need to act independently, that no one can just remove them for their term, that they can make the right decision for the right reason. And that's the kind of people we want in there. It's not people who got it just for a political appointment, but for people who will do the right thing for the right reason without obligation or loyalty to a particular person or party. And above all, the voters will decide in the 2018 midterms the fate of this of many constitutional amendments. House Speaker Pro Tempore, thank you so much for being on. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for having me. Then, hope we cleared up some things. I hope we did too. Amendments Explained is a production of UNC TV in association with the North Carolina Bar Association and the North Carolina Bar Association Foundation.